Coming up this week on Cabela's Sporting Dog Adventures, we head to northeastern Montana and hunt the famed Milk River area. It was rugged terrain and lots of miles were logged during this hunt as we look to take a trophy mule deer. Stay tuned for this episode of Cabela's Sporting Dog Adventures coming up next. Hey, pretty mama, go and grab the scatter gun. Rommel's looking like he's got one more good run. His hips are a little shaky, but his heart's still true. Oh, how that dog loves hunting with me and you. Sporting dog adventures, run, boy, run. Everything you need is here under the sun. Everything you need is here under the sun. This week, we're headed to Milk River Outfitters, where good friend Kevin Turner and I are in pursuit of a couple of trophy mule deer. We love our dogs here at Soggy Acres Retrievers, but every once in a while, they deserve a break. I was looking forward to hitting some rugged terrain hiking a lot, and trying to connect on my first trophy mule deer. We arrived at camp right at breakfast. We met our guide, and then we were brought up to speed on some great mule deer that had been taken here. The game plan was pretty simple. We'd hike into the wind, pop up over rises, we'd glass, we'd look for a good deer. But first, we had a baptism of sorts with a local river crossing. All right, so we gotta cross the river. It's wet, I took my shoes off. It's about 40 degrees. This is gonna suck. Right? You're already wet, you don't care. You're the guinea this time. You're not going first? You're the guide. Good optics and a good guide were essential for this area. We covered a lot of ground. We hiked, we glassed, we saw a lot of deer, and ultimately just kept moving until we found one that we wanted to connect with. Results of the first day gave us lots of encounters. We saw a lot of deer, but nothing we wanted to put a tag on. We had one really good buck that we came close on, but ultimately were busted by a doe. Our spirits were definitely up. We were excited to put a stock on a good buck in the coming days. So we just put like an hour stock on a really nice buck, and we had a doe that busted us. After she busted us, she ran down there, got him going, and then we jumped another bunch of deer and passed in one buck. He was close, but not quite what we were looking for. Whew. Hope you guys are enjoying this. It's frustrating. Stay tuned for more high-flying hoof action from northeastern Montana and the Milk River area coming up next on Cabela's Sporting Dog Adventures. Cabela's Sporting Dog Adventures is brought to you by Cabela's, Heavy Shot, hi -Viz, Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism, Big Dog Mowers, Conquest Sense, Hadel's Game Calls, Headwater Seat Covers, Liberty Safe, Mech Shooting Sports, Mobile Strong, Pheasants Forever, Real Tree Dog Food, Vanishing Paradise, Tacticam, and Soggy Acres Retrievers. 
This training tip is brought to you by these fine sponsors. Welcome to this week's training tip. Today, we have Alex. Alex is a young Labrador retriever that's here at our kennel Soggy Acres Retrievers for training. Alex is going to be a gun dog this fall, and one of the most important things you can teach a gun dog is whistle training. Whistle training is easy to do. Anyone can do it with their dog. What you do is what we call chaining. Chaining is when you use one command with the dog, and it means multiple things. So what we're gonna do is teach the sit command using our voice, using the command sit, but then bring in a whistle so that he understands that a whistle command will mean sit as well. For sit, Heel. we're gonna use one Heel. loud blast. Sit. Good. Heel. 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 Sit. Ultimately, Heel. we'll do that three or four Heel. times, sit. and then we will substitute Good. just the Heel. one whistle blast. Heel. To mean sit all by itself. Good boy. Good dog. You ultimately then use the command of here with three short blasts. Here. Alex, here. Again, we're gonna use three or four times as we cast him away and he comes back towards us. And the last time we'll just be using the whistles to mean here. Good boy. Ultimately, a crisp whistle is gonna be heard better by the dog in the field. It's gonna save your voice. And it's just gonna give you a better atmosphere to hunt in. That's this week's training tip. Now back to the hunt. Good dog, that's a good boy. Day two began with another trip across the river. Now, this time we pulled out the waders, so crossing was a little more pleasant. We had a different approach for the day. We got up really high and we glassed. We were going to try to find a really good buck or two that we could put a stalk on. We're out here early. We're glassing the ruts on, trying to uh, catch some deer running around. What you try to do is figure out where the deer are headed, cut them off, or bed them down so that we can get in on them and get a shot. We just saw a smaller buck down the valley below us. So now we're just trying to make sure there's nothing else with them. <sighs> Steep hike on the way up too. It's a lot of fun. This was a unique landscape with huge areas of public land, rolling hills, and rugged terrain. Our biggest hurdle was the wind. We had to move from coulee to coulee, ridge to ridge, and keep the wind in our favor. Because of how cold it was and with the wind, the deer were tucked down right in really small spots so that they could stay out of it. This made it difficult, and encounters were few and far between. We're in an area that looks like the moon. <laughs> Chasing me old deer. We were in here yesterday. We had them running everywhere. Came back into the same area today. There's just not a whole lot here. We're hoping they're gonna pop out here because we're getting toward evening and start feeding. So we're up here glassing. Hopefully uh, we can get some moving. It is tough hunting when you are in this area. There are so many little nooks and crannies for the deer to be in. It was windy today so they're really tucked in and you literally could glass all day and then walk over to an area and probably bump a really nice buck up just because you can't see everything. But we're definitely getting our exercise. And now let's head to the puppy kennel and get an update on Mike and her litter. Brought to you by Phytobite. Welcome to the Whelping Box. We are back with Micah and she has a big announcement to make. She has had her puppies. She had nine chocolates, five little girls and four little boys. And as you can see, they're very hungry and that's basically one of their only two jobs in life right now, which is to eat and to sleep. The little puppy is blind and deaf actually right now. It's making the little squeaking noises so that his mama can find him. We're gonna check this little baby's weight. He's about 1.6 or so at two days old. And we're gonna help track their uh, growth and make sure that they're progressing the way they're supposed to be.
With the sun sinking and the moon rising, time ultimately ran out on our second day. Coming up on Cavella Sporting Dog Adventures, the rut is on during the third day of our Montana hunt. We're also going to bring you a great venison recipe for shepherd's pie when we return on Cabela's Sporting Dog Adventures. And now it's time for What's Cooking with Kate, brought to you by these fine sponsors. Hey, welcome to What's Cooking with Kate. Kate, we're going to work on a recipe today. We've got some ground venison. What's in the plan? We are going to make a shepherd's pie with it. It's typically a dish people associate with either leftover pot roast or lamb, but we thought it would be a great way to use uh, extra venison versus just making jerky or a roast or something typical. We're gonna heat the pan. It's probably like three tablespoons full. So we're just gonna take the venison and kind of crumble it into the pan. And this is about, this is a pound and a half of meat. And then we're just gonna basically keep crumbling it and browning it and just moving it along so it doesn't have any big clumps. So why don't we go ahead and season it? All right, about how much black pepper are we looking at? I, I just go by look. I just do a, a good thorough covering. And with salt, same? Just uh, probably half as much, let's say, because we are trying to keep it a healthier recipe. And there's gonna be plenty of flavors. We don't need to rely on salt. Okay. That's good. And then let's throw your garlic in. We've got two cloves that we minced. Yep, that's fresh garlic. If you don't have it, of course you could use powdered, but fresh is gonna have a bit more flavor. All right, so now what do we put in? We've got our salt, we've got our pepper, we've got our garlic cloves This in. part is pretty much done. Now we're gonna work on incorporating some of our vegetables. So I took a couple of carrots and just diced them up and one very large yellow onion. You can use white if you like better. We've got peas. You can use fresh, frozen, or canned. Any of the three will do. Just make sure they're drained. Uh, and if you don't like peas, which some people totally hate on peas, don't use them. All right, so it's gravy time. Yes. So we're gonna do a two tablespoons or so of butter. We're just gonna add about two tablespoons or so of uh, flour. And we're gonna whisk. We're gonna add one cup of beef broth. All right, so now we have to put our gravy slash broth into our meat. Yep, just pour it in and do a little stirring. We're going to spray our pan. And I definitely recommend using a glass casserole pan. And then the fun part actually is the mashed potatoes, which I made just before we went on camera here. But one of the fun things that you can put in to help with the browning is an egg yolk. Not the whole egg, just the yolk. And then what we want to do is we put it on the top is you want to actually attempt to seal the edges. If you don't seal the edges, what you risk having happen is that the juices inside the pan here will bubble up and over the top and you're not going to get that nice browning effect, which is really what we're looking for. We're just going to top it with some paprika and some parsley. And then it's going to go into the broiler for about six to eight minutes on high. And basically all that's going to do is give us a nice browned top with a little tasty crust to it. And that is basically what we're looking for, correct? The nice brown top? That's it. And we actually did a really good job, as you can see, sealing the edges. Very, very little of the gravy and the juices are popping through, so that's why we got that really nice brown crust on the top. That's going to be really hot. Mm. Yummy. That's fantastic. Now back to the hunt. Even dogs love shepherd's pie. You like this? Day three started with glassing from the truck. We had several areas we were gonna check and hopefully find a good buck. So we're watching a few deer out in the field. One looks like a good solid four by four. We're gonna send Team Kevin after him and then we're gonna roll south and try to find some more deer. A little bit different tactic today. We're in the trucks spotting. And then uh, when we see something we want to go after, we're going to stalk them. A new day, new terrain, and new tactics brought the deer much closer.
we could definitely see a difference in the deer activity as the rut was obviously kicking into gear. We continued to work from coolie to coolie and we finally found two good bucks running together. Shoot the next one. One over. Come on. First shot was a miss, but we could see the two bucks chasing does. We kind of had an idea of where they were headed, so we moved ahead to intercept them. He's going to come. That's the big one. He's running right to it. Okay. Just wait. Just wait. He's going to run right in front where these does are. He's probably going to stop. What's a doe? It's the second one. He's going to slow down. He's going to slow down at the fence. This mule deer had already given us a slip once. My only hope was that he was going to follow the doe down through the open country and give me a clear shot. And now it's time for this week's Conservation Corner, brought to you by Vanishing Paradise. Nearly half of our nation's wetlands have been lost over the last 200 years, but nowhere is it more pronounced than along the Gulf Coast. Hunters and anglers across the country need to pay attention to this issue because 13 million ducks and geese winter on the Gulf, birds like teal, canvasbacks, and gadwalls. Sadly, the 2010 BP oil spill hit these wetlands hard, speeding up this erosion. The National Wildlife Federation and our Gulf State affiliates, as well as our many other great partners, are helping to reverse the impacts of the oil spill and stop coastal land loss. We need to make sure that BP's penalties are used to rebuild wetlands and other wildlife habitat. Find out how you can help at vanishingparadise.org slash sporting dog. Coming up on Cabela's Sporting Dog Adventures, we get a chance at a great mule deer. We'll see the results after the break. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for a chance to win a puppy just like this little guy from Soggy Acres Retrievers and a bunch of other great prizes from our sponsors. This product review is brought to you by these fine sponsors. Cabela's has come out with a great new line of e-collars. Our dogs use them a lot. We use them in the field, but we also train dogs here at Soggy Acres Retrievers. We've got thousands of hours on our e-collars. We've used them in many applications, upland, waterfowl, and the countless dogs that we train here at Soggy Acres Retrievers. This is a GS8000. It is a three quarter mile range, and it's nice because it actually works two different collars. It's got a little toggle switch where you flip from one to the other so you can run ultimately two dogs off one remote. The collar has 15 levels of stimulation. It's got an LCD screen. It's got a tone mode, as well as momentary and continuous buttons for your application of stimulation to the dog. Having your dog under control in the field is important to any upland, waterfowler, or person training. Having a good e-collar makes that possible. Check out the new Cabela's Gun Dog Series e-collars. Again, this is the GS8000. It's something we've put to the test in our kennel, and it's definitely passed. Hold on, hold on, he's gonna come. That's the big one, he's running right to it. Okay. Just wait, just wait. He's gonna run right in front where these does are. He's gonna stop right where that doe is. I hit him with the shot and he almost went down. He continued to follow the does, and he gave me one more clean shot at him. At this point, he was well over 400 yards away. He's down. Those two words were music to my ears. We finally had a good mealy on the ground. I was both ecstatic and relieved at the same time. The does ran right down to us. That deer was so friggin' far. Oh. Look at the wire on his antler. Cole, that was exciting. That deer came out. Man, I don't know how far he was. 356. But uh, I wasn't shooting high enough, I was shooting under him. Yep. And then when he jumped the fence at that one point, I hit him. And then he came up here and we, it was still probably, what, 400? <laughs> that was 400 yards, to, yeah, to where we were. And we got him. We got him. <laughs> nice shooting, oh, nice shooting. Awesome. Awesome. Now, I know you said I know you said you don't drag deer, but I think we probably can on this one. Yeah. <laughs> it's downhill. It's all downhill from here. So. I want to thank Cole Batdorf, Milk River Outfitters for taking us out on this hunt. 
We are so proud of this buck. We worked our butts off. We walked a lot, saw some great country, and in the end, we took a really, really nice solid buck. It's time to get him back to the truck. Hope you guys enjoyed this week's show. Stay tuned for next week's High Flying Adventures. Next week on Cabela's Sporting Dog Adventures, we head to Canada on a waterfowl hunt. The ducks fill the skies and the dogs don't disappoint as we chronicle a full day in the field with multiple setups and lots of action next week on Cabela's Sporting Dog Adventures. Closed captioning provided by Hadel's Game Calls. Why should you get puppy from Soggy Acres Retrievers? Because they're great hunters in the field. Soggy Acres puppies have great temperaments and they'll also become your best friend. And the number one reason, they're cutie pies. Don't do a cactus. Don't do a cactus. <laughs> With my hand. Oh, that's a good buck. Okay, so besides the Superman shirt, what else did you need? Underwear. <laughs> Socks. Pretty much everything. I got the Superman shirt for Kate, because I know she'd appreciate that. It's time to go out. <laughs>